There was a, uh, a quote that I've heard before that I saw again this week, and I don't remember exactly who said it, but it said something along the lines of, the most important thing about you is what you believe about God. And if you don't understand that, that's not just a, a, a Christian standing in front of you saying, our way is right. What it's saying is that what you believe about God affects every single thing that you do, every single emotion you have, everything you experience in the way that you view the world. So if I believe that God is good and that he's powerful, guess what that's going to crush? It's going to crush my worry. It's going to crush my fear, my, my anxiety. If I believe that he is loving and that he is forgiving, that means the stupid stuff that I did just this morning, right? When my family was rushing to get out of the house and I was angry that we weren't getting to where we needed to be fast enough, that means I'm forgiven. It means that he can use my weakness and turn it into something powerful to help somebody else. Like what you believe about God affects every other thing in your life. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to come to him and we're just going to submit to him and ask for him to teach us something about himself through this service. Can we do that? Is that cool? All right, let's do it. Father God, we come to you right now. I just thank you. I just thank you, first of all, for your love, for the way that you have always cared for us. God, that before we were born, before we did anything right or wrong, you sent your son to die for us. It's unheard of. There's no one else like you. And Jesus, I pray that today that you would help us to believe the words that are spoken here. I pray that you would close my mouth, that you would open yours, that you would help me to speak truth and to speak it not just to their brains, but to their hearts, and that your Holy Spirit would be here with us and that you would change us and transform us and help us to get to where we need to be, God. We cannot do any of this on our own. We can't do life alone. There's so many things, Lord Jesus, that are outside of our control, and we try so hard to, to cling to things that don't matter and cling to the control or the sense of control, which is really false, instead of just giving it to you and say, God, I know it's all in your hands anyway. Now do with it what you will. Jesus, I pray that every single person in this room today would leave trusting in your good plan for their lives, knowing that they can't do it better than what you've already prescribed because there is nothing better than what you've already given us in your son, Jesus. We love you so much. I pray that you would just be with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Well, why don't you take a minute to uh, say hey to the person next to you? High fives, fist bumps, elbows, cuddles. That's true. I figure most people got their shot by now. Did you? <laughs> All right, that's enough. No, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, I just want to take a minute to, uh, you know, to brag on what God is, is doing here in this church. And one of the things that I've always loved about our church is that, um, you know, this is a place where we show honor to our leaders, right? That's a biblical idea is honoring your pastor, honoring your leaders. But one of the things we don't is we don't put them on a pedestal as if they're any different from us. And, and what happens a lot of times is when people put somebody on a pedestal, if you put the pastor or a, another leader on a pedestal, what happens is, um, one, is they get filled with pride, but they also get really lonely because that means people are afraid to, you know, confront them ab about things. They're afraid to um, help them, sort of expecting them uh, to help uh, with their problems, but not expecting them to have any issues. And I mentioned it a little bit in that video, but I had a rough morning this morning. My wife knows I had to apologize to her because I got really angry. It was a stressful morning running around. And backstage, like I was just kind of getting ready and just trying to prepare. And Ronnie saw that I was, uh, I was hurting, you know, and he pulled me aside and he said, can I pray for you? And I can, I can count on my hands, uh, my, on one hand, probably how many times people have offered to pray for me directly. Um, and so I'm grateful for that. So thank you for that. And I'm grateful for the culture that we have here um, that would uh, open the door for you guys to pray for me as well. So um, I'm grateful for that. Well, listen, we're in the last week of our wisdom series. It's been really cool. It's been an awesome series. Um, I love the book of Proverbs. And today we're going to be tackling the topic of controlling your tongue. <laughs> And 50 people walked out the door. They don't want to hear anything. They don't want to talk about it. 
there was a, um, you know, there's very few times where I'll see a commercial that actually causes me to stop and reflect. You know, during the Super Bowl and stuff, you'll find a lot of funny commercials. There's a lot of noteworthy, you know, commercials that we can talk about. But there's very few times where I can actually stop and it causes me to think. And there was one such commercial that came out a few years ago. It was for like a, an advertising, like content creation agency. And the commercial started with a shot of this guy who was homeless and he's sitting on a, like an unfolded cardboard box and he's got a can out next to him and he's got a sign next to it and he's homeless and, and the sign says, it says, I'm blind, please help. And so he's sitting there, maybe some of you have seen this before, um, but he's sitting next to this can and the sign and he's just sitting there and you see all these people walking back and forth, passing right in front of him, right? He can't see them, but he can hear their footsteps and time and after time, he hears the footsteps, but no change going into his can. And there's all these people hanging out in the area around him and nobody is actually stopping to help until this one woman walks by and then she backs up and you think maybe for a moment that she's going to drop something in his can but instead what she does is she bends down and she picks up his sign and she takes his marker and he's like what is going on because he can hear all this happening and she starts scribbling words on this sign and she puts the sign back down puts the pen back down smiles and walks away a few moments later the first person walks by sees the sign and places some money in his can and then another person, another person, one after another after another until he's got all this change piled up in his can. It's laying in front of him. It's all over the place. And he's so grateful, but also so confused. And a little bit later in the day, the woman walks back through that same way and she sees the man sitting there uh, and he's got his stuff uh, filled up and, and she stops and he realizes it's her. And he, he says, what did you do? And she said, I said the same thing, but in a different way. And, and they, they finally pan over to the sign, because up to this point, we haven't seen what it says yet. And it went from saying, I'm blind, please help, to this. It said, it's a beautiful day, and I can't see it. And, and like, I watch that commercial, and, like, it stops and makes me think. I've seen it several times. It went viral. Um, like, 28 million-plus people have watched this video on YouTube. And it went viral, and it's just a reminder every single time I watch it that the words that we speak are powerful, that they're powerful, that they matter. Now, in our culture, one of the things that we love to say, uh, and, and this is something we say all the time, we say actions speak louder than words, right? Which is true. I believe that. We have to back up what we say with our actions. Otherwise, we're hypocrites, right? Right? It's, it's false, and we've, we've seen too many hypocrites, and we've all been hypocrites at times. We don't like when, when we're that person, and we certainly don't like being around those people. If it's all talk, it's no good. But the problem is that when we say actions speak louder than words, a lot of times our culture sort of twists that idea into meaning words don't have power, and that is absolutely not true. It's completely false. The right words at the right time, spoken in the right way, can set people free. It can inspire people to faith. It can motivate them. It can bless them. It can help them and pull them out of the pit that they're in. And the wrong words at the wrong time, spoken in the wrong way, can just bury people under the ground. And some of you people are thinking right now about the things that your parents said to you, the things that your supposed friends said to you, that... That, that these people in your life that you've been close to have said to you that have, have hurt you. And so you know what I'm talking about, but we're really going to try to drive the point home today. The first verse we're going to look at from Proverbs today is Proverbs 18.21. It says this. It says, the tongue can bring death or life. Is that powerful? Yeah. The tongue can bring death or life. And those who love to talk will reap the consequences. You've probably heard the principle of the seed before. The principle of the seed, you, you may have heard it in a number of different ways, but the principle of the seed is that you will reap what you sow, right? That you will harvest what you plant. What you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And a lot of times we've heard this in, uh, in uh 
correlation to the way that we work or the, the way that we give or whatever the case may be. But here Proverbs is saying the same is true of our words. Let me show you a picture real quick. Um, we have these seeds uh, that I looked up online. Um, and uh, they're very tiny. Um, they're probably like about that big, maybe like a, a little more than a centimeter across. Um, if you're European, otherwise they're about a quarter inch. Um, and, uh, and, and so they're small. There's the, these small little seeds. And I looked them up online, and you can actually buy these on Amazon. You can buy 100 of them for $2, right? And so they're small, and they're cheap. And as a result, that it, it would be easy to think that they're not valuable and that they're completely disposable and many of us view our words in the same way. We say, well, it's just words. It's just words. They're small and they're cheap, and so they're disposable. But here's the problem. Sometimes when you, when you plant those seeds, whether they're good or they're bad, they find soil to take root in. They find minds to take root in. They find hearts to take root in. If you're a parent, take note because what you are speaking into your children, you're speaking their future into being by the way that you talk to them and about them, right? And so we, we speak these words and we feel like they're not valuable because they're so small and they're so insignificant. But once they get planted in the right soil, look what they become. Those seeds that we were just looking at a moment ago that were this big, that are 100 for $2, are giant sequoia seeds. That is a grown woman standing inside of a giant sequoia tree. That is not photoshopped. Listen, the seeds that you sow in passing have the potential to take root and become permanent in someone's life. That if you're not careful and you spit the wrong seeds out, if you spit the wrong things out, if you're downplaying people and belittling people and calling them stupid, whatever the case may be, if you put out the wrong words, even if it's just in a moment of passion, you're going you're gonna to plant something that could grow into a monstrosity later. And on the other hand, that if you speak life-giving words to people, that if you plant the right seeds, then something could take root that could be a beautiful, permanent fixture in their life that would change them for all eternity. But words are powerful. Words are powerful. And as a result, we need to learn how to control them. There are real consequences. Proverbs 13.3 says this. It says, those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. <laughs> Proverbs keeping it real, man. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. And I want to pause here for a second, especially for those of you that aren't believers in this room. If you haven't, you're not sure about Jesus yet, you're just kind of feeling out this church thing. I want to pause here because the book of Proverbs is about wisdom. Right? This isn't just your mama telling you, you need to watch your mouth, young man. This isn't that. It's not your mama. It's your heavenly father saying, look, I want good things for you, and so I'm going to tell you how to get them. Which means, control your mouth, because I want you to have a better life. This is a blessing from God that he gives us this wisdom that we would learn to control our tongues. But the problem as we all know, is that powerful things are difficult to control. Have you ever seen the, the, the fail videos online, like on YouTube or whatever, where somebody gets like a new, like super powerful motorcycle that they've never ridden before, and they sit on it, and as soon as they rev that thing, it jumps out from under, their body sits still, and it jumps out from under them, does a pop a wheelie, and just smashes on the ground. Have you ever seen that, right? Powerful things are hard to control, and our tongues are no different. They're no different at all. James says that, that if a person, uh, James in the New Testament, who's the half-brother of Jesus, he, he, says, he says, look, if, if you could control your tongue 100% of the time, you would be in perfect control of yourself always because it is the hardest part of your body to keep in control because it takes a moment of frustration or anger or jealousy or hate or whatever the case may be to let 
word vomit just come out all over the place. Right? It, look, I recognize the fact that not all the time are we out of control with our tongues. It's not like we're all just sitting here broadcasting everything we think. But in those moments of frustration, what's coming out? It's bad news. It's bad news most of the time. And so today, what I want to do is I want to focus on just a few ways that we can get better control of our tongues. You guys with me? Yeah? All right. All right. We'll work on that. That's fine. Um, I'm preaching to myself anyway. Here's the first way we can get better control of our tongue. We can choose to listen first. We can choose to listen first. Check out this proverb, 20, uh, chapter 20, verse 12. Ears to hear and eyes to see, both are gifts from the Lord. You know what's not listed in there? Your mouth. <laughs> right? Ears to hear and eyes to see, both are are gifts from the Lord. Listen, your mouth is not listed there for a reason. It's not listed there for a reason. That's not to say that what you say can't be a gift, but it's just saying it's so difficult to control. And, and wisdom comes not from airing your opinions about everything, but through observing the world around you, through observing the Word of God, through observing other people, and that's how we grow in wisdom. And so we choose to listen first. Here's another verse for you. Proverbs 18, 13. It says, Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. I know people who are in relationships who some, you know, where something happened and, and, and the one spouse jumped to some sort of crazy conclusion and started accusing the other spouse of stuff and the other spouse is like, what in the world are you talking about? And they were jumping to all these conclusions and now they're, they're split or they're separated because they refused to listen. They wouldn't listen to the facts before they actually jumped on the other person. And sadly, I think that this is becoming the norm in the United States. That if you jump on social media after some sort of tragedy or something, what you will see is before any real facts have been released about whatever crime or tragedy happened, everybody and their mama already has an opinion about what happened. Tell me how that is or why that is. And the short answer is because we're unwise. It's we're not willing to wait it out before we actually share what it is that we think, or, or to, to wait to develop our opinion. I'll give you a personal example of my failure uh, in this area. So it actually happened just this week. So uh, I, I sent Josh Watson. I got two Josh Watson stories for you today, so you get ready, Josh. Um, he's our computer guy back there. I sent Josh Watson an email this week, and I said, hey, um, last Sunday you used the wrong graphic for this thing. I said, you know, keep, please you know, keep an eye on that. Basically, like, let's do better in the future kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it wasn't any big deal. It's just a picture. But, you know, nevertheless, I, I put that out there. And then a after I sent the email, which, by the way, you can't take emails back. I don't know if you knew this. After I sent the email, I then investigated a little bit. And what I realized is that I had never communicated to him that he needed to use it. <laughs> and, so, and so I immediately sent a follow-up email and said, hey, uh, that last email was a little blamey. What I really should say is I'm sorry because I didn't tell you about it, right? But we all do this. And so think about in your own life where you're jumping to conclusions, whether it's social media stuff, whether it's relationship stuff, keep your mouth shut until you know the facts. Be willing to listen first. And I'm not telling you to like be quiet and just wait your turn to speak. I'm not saying that. What I'm telling you to do is I'm asking you to seek understanding so that you don't share an ignorant opinion. It's going to save you a lot of grief in the long run. The next thing is this. One of the ways we control our tongues is we actually think before we speak. Proverbs 15, 28. The heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking, and the mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. The heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking, but the mouth of the wicked overflows with evil words. And, and when I see that overflowing, it makes me think of a dam in a river, right? They, they build this dam in this river, and it creates a reservoir of water behind it, and there's water going through. And the thing about dams is most of them, they don't stop all of the water from going. They just limit how much can go through. 
right? And so if you look at like the Hoover Dam or some of these other ones, they even have these floodgates. They can adjust how much water goes through. And the reason why they do that is because they only want a healthy amount to go through. Right? When water is going downstream at the right click, it's, it's, it's watering crops, it's giving people drinking water, um, it's taking care of the village that's down here. But if you remove the dam all of a sudden, you have no filter at all, guess what's going to happen? That village is going to be gone. It's going to be completely destructive. In other words, God has given you a brain so that when the, when the, the things that formulate in your heart... They, they have a, a place to go to be filtered through before they get to your mouth. That, that you don't want your words to bypass your brain. Because listen, if we're completely honest, we don't think before we speak. We feel before we speak. Right? It's just instantly like from here to here. And it's like blah. And we just throw it out there. And we think it's okay because I'm just expressing my feelings. Well, no, that's not what the scriptures say. It's saying you're out of control. It's saying that you're overflowing, and guess what? That could mean destruction for you, for the people around you, right? I remember being, (laughs) I was working this one job. I was in an office setting, and the uh, executive director of this organization had hired an assistant, and this assistant just said whatever he wanted whenever he was feeling it, and that relationship did not last long at all. It did not last long at all, and it was because there was no filter there. There was no filter And so what I want to share with you uh, in this moment is just a couple of the filters that I always try, don't always succeed, but always try to put my words through before they actually come out of my mouth. Here's the first one. And these are all in the form of questions. Like I'm asking myself these things before I'm actually speaking to people. The first question is this, is, is it true? Is what I'm about to say true? Do I know for certain that it's the truth? There are a lot of different types of lies that we can tell. You know, we can tell lies about our enemies. Proverbs 25, 18 says this. It says, telling lies about others is as harmful as hitting them with an axe, wounding them with a sword, or shooting them with a sharp arrow. Vivid. <laughs> like, like the Bible is not messing around, man. Like, like you are going to hurt some people by telling lies about them. Um, this is a stupid example, but it always comes to mind when we talk about this. When I was a kid, my, my, I have a, an older brother um, and a younger sister, and my younger sister was just defenseless. I mean, I feel bad for you girls that had older brothers. I mean, just defenseless. We used to beat her up and pick on her all the time. Um, and, and, but she had her own defenses that she had developed, namely that when she didn't like something that we did, she would run to mom and say, he hit me even if we didn't. And then I'd be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? Right? These lies, these lies that hurt us. And in your relationships, and in your work, in your, your, your marriage, it's even more detrimental because it drives a wedge between you and the person that you're lying about. And, 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 and it's, it's really a form of hatred to be lying about someone else. But we don't just lie about our enemies. We also lie to our friends. Proverbs 29.5 says this, It says to flatter friends is to lay a trap for their feet. And I remember reading this and thinking, what is this telling me? Is it telling me like if I like if I'm giving someone a compliment, is it telling me that I'm like maybe I'm doing something divisive? (laughs) You're all right. (laughs) I'm like, am am I am I like actually harming them? And then I realize that what it's telling me is that if I see a friend going the wrong way and I don't speak the truth to them and instead just encourage them to continue the way that they're going, that what I'm really doing is harming them, that I'm setting them up for failure. Um, Here's my other Josh Watson story. Um, Whenever we first moved into our house out here a couple years ago, um, uh, the the Watsons and the, uh, the Candelarias came over to our house, and it was in the evening, and they hadn't seen it yet, and so they wanted to be shown around, and it was getting dark out, and so um, we... We, uh, we have this big, beautiful backyard. It's my favorite thing about our, our property is the, the backyard, and it goes into the woods and stuff like that. And so even though it was dark, I was like, I really want to show them this stuff. And so, so we went out our, our back door and down into the, um, the, the caged or fenced-in area where my dog hangs out. Well, the problem is that we had just gotten my dog, and there was a big hole that he had dug in the backyard. And Josh, you remember this? So we were walking through this caged area in the backyard and I can see out of my peripheral vision, I'm just like showing them stuff. I can see him bobbing sort of next to me as we're walking along. And then next thing I know, he's just gone. 
It was just gone. Like literally I was like, what happened? He could have fallen into a bottomless pit and I wouldn't have known. But my dog, who's a hundred pounds, had dug this huge hole and it was dark out and I didn't warn him because I forgot about it. That was accidental. So, um, but I forgot and he just like, boom, gone. And I turn around and he's like, he's got like his leg like up to here and he's like hunched over on the ground. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that just happened. Listen, some of you, by flattering your friends and telling them, yeah, that guy's, you know what, he's good for you, don't worry about it, even though in the back of your mind you're like, he's got some tendencies that are really concerning, or, or you've got some behavior in your life that they know about but they're not willing to call you out on, or, or vice versa, you're, you're not being a good friend to the other person because you're not calling them out on their tendencies, what you're really doing is you're setting them up to fall into a pit. And I think as, as believers, let me talk to the Christians for a minute. If you're a believer in the house today, I think the biggest, most concerning part of this is that many of us are so afraid of what people will think of us that we're afraid to warn our friends that hell is a real place and that Jesus is the only solution to getting us out of that real place. We're afraid. But to flatter people and to just say, yes, just keep going your own way, everything's going to be fine, is to lie directly to their faces and to lay a trap for their feet. And so we don't want to lie about that. But if, if, if we're completely honest, the, the, the biggest reason why we actually lie is simply to protect ourselves. It's, it's not to hurt other people. It's not to, to flatter our friends. We lie to protect ourselves. I've shared this story before about how I used to, um, uh, I got into a professional writing uh, job for a little while. It was my first one I ever had, and I was writing content for this web company. And um, one day my supervisor came along and she said, hey, I want you to write reviews uh, of all these products and post the reviews online. And I said, okay, and I started to do it. And then I started thinking, I have never used these products before, and they have me writing reviews about things I know nothing about. And so I went to my boss and I said, look, I, this is dishonest. I said, I don't feel comfortable. I was very respectful to her, but I said, look, I don't feel right about doing this. You're asking me to write reviews about products I've never used to convince people to buy them. And I'm posing as somebody who's actually used them. I said, I feel like this is dishonest. I don't want to do this. And I took a risk at that moment, knowing that it was a risk. I didn't expect her to just be like, oh, okay, everything's fine, you know? And I knew that it would be a challenge to her authority and to the company and all this stuff. But nevertheless, I told her, and as I've shared before, a few weeks later, I was let go from that job. Um, they said it was because of the economy. I question whether or not that's the case. Um, but, but nevertheless, I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor God and say, I'm going to do what God has called me to do and trust him to let the chips fall where they may. Like, God is in control of the chips. They're not just random. Like, to him, he knows exactly where they're going to fall. And I said, I'm just going to trust that his goodness and his plan is at work in my life. And so when you lie to protect yourself, when you lie to protect yourself, there's, there's two reasons why I think it's bad. The first is, is it doesn't show that you have any trust in God at all. What you're essentially saying is what I'm going to do is I'm going to fix this situation for myself rather than saying God has called me to do this thing and I'm going to do it. I'm going to be obedient even if it leads to my downfall for a moment. I know that ultimately God is working out his good plan for me and that I can trust him more than I can trust myself. If you're in the habit of lying to protect yourself, I want you to really seriously look at your heart and ask, do I really trust God with this situation? And I think that you'll find that if you are going to lie, that the answer is no. But the second reason why lying is no good is because it doesn't reflect the character of God. That if you're a Christian in this room, you are automatically an ambassador of Jesus, which means when people look at you, you are what they will believe Jesus to be. And so if you are a hypocrite, they're going to see Jesus as a hypocrite, right? If you're a liar, they're going to see Jesus as a liar, right? You are his ambassador. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh, I'm so grateful you guys know that verse. Whew. That could have been really awkward. Um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But you know what the scripture says about Satan? It says that he is the father of lies. And that when he speaks, his native tongue is deception. That just as you and I speak English, and some people speak Italian, and some people speak Chinese, that Satan's native tongue 
is deception. And so when you're speaking lies, you're representing him better than you're representing Christ. It's a problem for the believer. It's a problem. Is it true? The second filter. Is it loving? Ephesians 4.29 says this. It says, don't use foul or abusive language. Let, what's that word? Everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. This takes into account two things. It takes into account what you say and how you say it. That's right. Who said that? Gold star right there. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Um, What you say and how you say it. I was reading a book this week, and um, they were talking about these different organizations and businesses and stuff. And there's a company I don't know much about, um, but it's called Sevenly. Anybody ever hear of Sevenly? They sell, like, clothes and stuff like that? Okay. So it's a, it's a pretty decent-sized uh, online company, and they sell, like, T-shirts and artwork and stuff like that. Um, but the, the founder of this company is a Christian. And he wrote this book called uh, Prof, or People Over Profit. A CEO of a company wrote a book called People Over Profit. And I'm like, man, that's amazing. And so um, when you dive into this book, he, he talks about all kinds of things. And one of the things he discusses is the fact that sometimes as a business, even if you're loving, you have to fire people who aren't working out for the business. And so in this book, he says, I'm taking the, the, the second greatest commandment, which is to love your neighbor as yourself, and I'm applying it to firing people. And so what he essentially says is um, in their company, they ask themselves, um, uh, I'm going to fire people the way that I would want to be fired. And so here's what it looks like in their company. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about being loving in our speech here, right? So they don't bring them into the boardroom and stick, wave the finger in their face and tell them how dumb they were and how worthless they were, right? Instead, what they do is they bring them in and they sit them down and they focus, first of all, only on performance issues and nothing about their personal issues. It's only about the work that they've done. They're not trying to belittle the person or tear them down. They give them a real generous, nice severance package, right? Like they're going to send them off with some extra money in their pocket. They give them a letter of recommendation if they can. They literally bring team members around to talk about um, the, the good things and the things that they love about the person that they're firing. And then they pray over that person before they send them out. Like the only way that could be better is if, like, as they were kicking you out the door, they laid a mattress on the ground in front of you and so that you fall right onto it and then you can get up and walk away. Like, that is a beautiful thing. And, and what I'm getting at here is that you can be both loving and also take care of your business and tell the truth at the same time. And they found a way to do it. And I just thought that was the coolest thing. But being loving in our speech also means we utilize our influence to help people in need. Proverbs 31, 8 through 9 says this, it says, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. I remember a a little while ago, Josh Eisen uh, came to a meeting, and I think he posted on Facebook too, so it's public knowledge, it'll be right. Um, (laughs) He came to a meeting and he told us a story about how um, he and his family had been at McDonald's and they had seen, I believe, a dad or something uh, basically getting on, yelling at his kids and I think slamming them on the bench, right? Like being really overly aggressive, uh, borderline abusive, if not straight up abusive. And, and what I love about um, Josh Eisen is he's a man of conviction. Even if you don't always agree with him, he's going to stand by his conviction. And he stood up and he superhero posed, pointed at the guy and said, hey! And told him to knock it off, and I believe threatened to call the police and all this stuff. And, and the guy sort of cowered, and Becca was right by his side. Both of them uh, are wonderful people. But they stood up for these kids that were completely de- defenseless against a grown man. And I just wonder how many opportunities, if, if we really opened our eyes, might we have to do that for the people around us? You know, the, the, the employees at work who are just getting bashed on by, uh, by our coworkers. That gets fun. You know how every, every, every work site seems to have the punching bag, right? There's the guy or the girl that's the punching bag. Imagine if, imagine if you were the one that stood up for the punching bag. 
Would your reputation take a hit? Probably. Would Jesus' reputation get better in their eyes? Heck yeah, it would. You know, be amazing. Is it loving? Before it comes out of your mouth, you got to ask that question. How about this one? Is it necessary? Bless you, bro. Goodness. Is it necessary? Proverbs 16.28 says, A troublemaker plants seeds of strife, and a gossip separates the best of friends. Gossip is a poison. The Bible talks about it often because it's so bad. The Hebrew word for gossip essentially means someone who reveals secrets. Meaning there's, there's stuff that you know about other people, whether it's true or not, maybe you've heard it, maybe you actually know it, that is nobody else's business and you go around sharing it. And, and I guarantee you, you've never once gossiped in your life in order to talk up somebody else. Never once. It's always to bring yourself up and to push them down every single time. And so the question that I always ask myself whenever I'm talking to people, especially when I I need to talk about other people, even within the church, is I'm, I'm asking myself, does this person really need to know this information? In fact, there's people who've come up to me before and they've said things like, hey, I gotta tell you something, and then they'll start telling me a story and then they go, I don't know if I should tell you this, and I will tell them, don't. Shut your mouth. I love you. I'll run away. Whatever. Don't. There's a, there's a verse. <laughs> there's a verse in, uh, somewhere in Proverbs that in one of the translations says essentially that when somebody is gossiping, you're supposed to avoid a gossip. And I've actually heard of a pastor who took this story literally, and there was a woman in his church that was gossiping all the time. And always, always she was the information gatherer. Right? She'd come up and she'd be like, hey, how can I pray for you? And then she would go and talk about it to this other person, not to Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And so she was this person who was always really busy. And, and whenever he would see her, he would avoid her. And this went on for weeks and weeks. And she hadn't talked to him for a long time, even though she really wanted the scoop and all the details. And so one day she finally like cornered him. And she said, she said, have you been avoiding me? And he's like, yes. Because the Bible says to avoid a gossip. Listen. Jesus came to this earth to reconcile things, to bring things together, not to tear them apart. And if you're engaging in gossip, and the Bible specifically warns of widows, like people who don't have a lot to do, older people, maybe you've got a lot of extra time and and maybe you're not working anymore, be careful about what's coming out of your mouth because it's dangerous and it's divisive. Is it necessary that you speak it? And then the last filter I always put it through is, is I ask myself, is the timing right? If something comes to mind and I really need to tell something, somebody to something, I need to speak the truth to them in love, I always ask myself, is this the right time? Like, I'll give you an example. Sometimes it comes to mind and I'm standing in a group of people and it's something that should probably be better, it would be better off told in private to them one-on-one then the worst thing I could do is take that moment and say, I have to do it right now. To pull them aside, they're going to exp- take that as so much more loving, so much more careful and helpful and, and not embarrassing that I pulled them aside and I said, hey, look, we need to address this thing than if I were to do it in a big group of people. Is the timing right? And so when we're talking about control, we're starting with listening first, then we're moving into um, thinking before we speak and putting it all through the right filters. And the very last thing is this. We need to get control over our words by dealing with what is in our hearts. Now let me explain. When we have these filters, those things are good for blocking hateful things from coming out, from blocking wicked things from coming out of our mouths. But let me ask you a question. Where are those things coming from in the first place? Right. As believers, they're coming, even in believers, like these old habits die so hard, even though God is making us new, and there's still old hate that needs to be dealt with. There's still old anger that needs to be dealt with. Old uh, um, selfishness and self-absorption and, and jealousy that needs to be dealt with. And like I said earlier, the problem isn't all the time. It's not like you're constantly spewing stuff because even like super wicked, deceitful people can control their words most of the time. 
but it's the times where you get really emotional and the feelings become too much and it causes those filters to come down that we really finally see what's in our own hearts. For example, have you ever been on the phone with somebody and you're getting really angry and you're really frustrated at what they're telling you and you're talking and you're talking and you're like, yeah, man, okay, it was great talking to you too. And you hang up and then you say something that's contrary to the conversation you were just having. Like, like you, you're like, man, it's stupid. Like, like, you're like, that's so dumb. I can't, this guy's so annoying, blah, blah, blah. Like, it's happened. It's happened. I'll give you another example. I heard this story this week of uh, this kid who, um, who's driving along with his mom. He's a little kid. He's in the back seat. Mom's driving down the road. And he just goes, Mama? She goes, yeah. He goes, why do the idiots only come out when daddy's driving? <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh. Like, and, it's, and it's so true. Like, w- like when we get really frustrated, really angry, whatever the case may be, when the emotions get high, the filter comes off. And the thing is, it's in those moments that you really get to discover what is inside of you at any given moment. What, like what is actually inside of you? Here's what Proverbs um, 1727 says. It says, a truly wise person uses few words, and a person with understanding is even tempted, or even tempered, even tempered, is even tempered. If anger is your thing, you're going to be destructive with your words. You're going to be like a fire-breathing dragon. You have to get that under control, and that is a heart issue. The problem for those of you that are angry a lot, it's not your tongue, it's your temper. And so when we're, we're really frustrated, those, those filters come down. And so I, I just want to ask, we're going to be wrapping up here soon, and we're going to be doing communion and all these wonderful things, but I need you to, to evaluate yourself for a moment. When those filters truly come down, the question is this, what is remaining? What comes out of you when they come down? Is it hate? Is it lust? Is it fear? Is it racism? Is it prejudice? What is it that comes out of you? Is it greed? When the filters drop and you finally let your guard down, what comes out? Or is it love? Is it faith? Is it joy? Is it hope? I'll wrap up with this thought. We need to to understand that our words are powerful, probably more powerful than we realize. We need to learn to control them. But, but what I really want to focus on today is what is going on in your heart that would make you say those things when your filter is down. And I'll share a story. Um, have, you, have you ever heard a song and you liked the song, but then when you heard the artist explain why they wrote the song, you liked it even more? You guys know what I'm talking about? Like there's always a story behind each song. It's never just complete nonsense. Well, I learned that about a song um, this week. And... Uh, it's an old hymn. I used to go to a pretty traditional church, and we did hymns and stuff like that, and you had the lady on the piano and, um, you know, like some brass instruments and stuff like that. And, and so we're listening to the song, and I, I grew up hearing it over and over again. And this song is about, it's about um, basically finding peace and finding hope no matter the circumstances. That's what it's about. And I had heard it so many times, and I liked it. But, but this week I read the story about how it came to be, and it absolutely, like, messed me up in the best way possible. In the late 1800s, there was a man, his name was uh, Horatio Spafford, and he wasn't a hymn writer. He wasn't a hymn writer. He was actually a lawyer, and he's one of the top lawyers in Chicago, a big shot, and he was a Christian guy, and he had a family, he had a wife, and he had four daughters, And um, he had gone through some loss. He had experienced some problems because the great Chicago fire or whatever had uh, ruined some of his real estate prospects and stuff like that. But, you know, he was doing all right. And he trusted in God and he leaned on God. And and at one point in the late 1800s, he said, you know what, we're going to go on an extended vacation. We're going to go to to England for a little while because one of his friends was uh, Dwight L. Moody, who was this uh, amazing preacher who traveled the world, still famous today. Um, for his preaching. And so they said, you know what, we're going to go over there, but I have some business I have to attend to first. And so I'm going to send you guys over there first. And so he put his family on a ship from New York to to London. 
and, and he sent them across the ocean and he said, you know, what? I'll catch up with you when you're there. Enjoy your vacation. And um, while they were on their way across the ocean, another ship collided with theirs. The ship sank. His four daughters drowned. And only his wife survived. In fact, she was one of the only survivors out of the entire ship. So she was rescued and they took her over to London and she began to receive treatment or whatever and she sent a message home to him and, and said, basically, I'm the only one that survived the trip. And he immediately rushed away from Chicago and started sailing overseas to go and be with his wife. Um, and uh, as he was sailing he came to the spot where the ship went down and his daughters died. Imagine being on the ocean and taking the same path and knowing this is where my, 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 my little children died just not too long ago. And for many of us, that, that, that causes the filter to drop, right? Right? The emotions are coming out. The filter drops. We're going to find out what's really in our heart. And so many of us would be angry with God and angry with the people steering the boat and, and frustrated and, and just sad and just despairing and losing all hope. And it was in that spot that this, this lawyer penned these words, which many of you probably know. He wrote these words. He said, When peace like a river... When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You know, um, in the moment where that man's filter was down, and he was over the spot where his daughters had just died. He writes these lyrics that essentially say that whether, whether everything is peaceful and good or everything is horrible and bad and falling apart in my life, you have taught me that true peace and true confidence and true joy is something that is found in you. And I can say that no matter what happens in my life on the outside, even losing my little loved ones, I can say it is well, it is well, with my soul, because it's your plan in action. That I trust that you have good things for me, enough to say it is well with my soul. And he's bearing his heart to the world, and it's become a song that's been sung by millions and millions and millions all over the world, even still so today. And so I want to I wanna ask you, what would cause a man in that moment of grieving, to write words like that? And the answer is simple, that when the filter came down, what was revealed in his heart was the fact that he had a trust, a deep and abiding trust in Jesus. And I'm going to share a verse with you. It's kind of out of order, so I don't know if uh, you'll even be able to find it, Matt. But it's something I meant to say earlier that I think just goes really well right now, so I want to make sure I get it. It comes from Luke 6.45. And in this passage, Jesus is saying that a tree is identified by its fruit. In other words, what he's saying is, like, if you see an apple on a tree, you know it's an apple tree. If you see a pear, you know it's a pear. And what he's really saying is that but by what you say and what you do, it reveals what is in your heart. It counts for something because it shows us what you're made of. And he says these words in Luke 6.45. He says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart, and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what is in your heart. And so if you would stand with me, we're going to pray in just a moment, but I want to ask, when everything is, is opened up and bearing your soul before God, what is it exactly that He sees? 
when your filters come down, what comes out of you? I want you to know that if that, that this just can't be a message. This can't be a message of me just saying you need to do better with what you say. It needs to be a message where you recognize that the things that pour out of your lips that you know shouldn't be there. It's a recognition that they're coming from a dark place that only God can get to and can transform and can change. And so if you could close your eyes for just a moment... As we get ready to pray, I want to ask two questions. First one is this. If you're a believer in the house today, if you've given your life to Jesus, you put your faith in Him, but you have been lax with controlling your words because you falsely believe that it doesn't matter what you say or maybe you've just minimized the damage that you think you're doing. And you just need to say, Jesus, you know what? I need you to help me with this control issue. I need you to root out the, the anger and the hatred and the frustration in my heart so I don't offend anyone, so I don't destroy anything by what I say. If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand in the air while everybody's eyes are closed. Lots of us. This is a hard problem, man. Hard problem to deal with. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, but go ahead and put your hands down for now. The other person I want to talk to real quick is the person who would stand here today and would say, you know what? I listened to that story about that man who wrote those words that were so filled with hope. And I realized that I look at my life and I think about how I view God. And what I realize when I look at that is that I have no hope. That I don't know where to find it that I haven't been forgiven of my sins, I haven't trusted in God, I have no relationship with Him whatsoever, I don't even know where I'm going when I die. I want you to know something very simple. That our hope as Christians is not rooted in what we can do. It's not rooted in fixing our words or controlling ourselves better. It's rooted in the fact that there is a God in heaven who stepped down to this earth to die as a sacrifice for us, carrying your sins and mine on his shoulders at the cross so that as he died, you could be given new life. And all you have to do is put your trust in him today. That you don't have to wait for it. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to fix your mouth before you can receive it. In fact, you can't. That all he wants to do is a starting point to give you a new life is for you to trust him. And so my question is, who here is ready to trust Jesus today? If that's you, I just want you to slip your hand up and say, I trust him today. Is there anybody in this room? I see you, brother. Anybody else? I see you right here. Anybody else? I need to put my faith in Jesus today and his sacrifice for me. I see you up front. Anybody else? I see you back there. Here's the deal. Those of you that raised your hands, this is a first step in a new life. That if you've truly put your faith in Him and what He's done for you, that you are completely forgiven of your sins. That you can now have a real relationship with the God that created you. That you can now experience peace and you can experience joy because you no longer have to fear death or anything else because God has a good plan for your life. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you right now and I just thank you for the work that you've done today. God, I just thank you for everybody in this room who said, you know what, I need, I need to have some better control over the words that are coming out of my mouth. I need to quit underestimating the potential that they carry for good or for evil. I pray that you would help them, God, that your spirit working inside of them would remind them constantly to put it through the filters of love and put, put it through the filter of timing and, and, and whether or not it's necessary and whether or not it's the truth, God. Help them to constantly filter those things. But I, God, I just pray most importantly that you would work on their hearts. And I know that there's people in this room today who are realizing that there are some dark corners 
of an otherwise bright heart that you've illuminated. And I just pray that you would help them to address those things and that you would replace the hate with love. And God, I, I pray for those who raised their hand today and said, I put my faith in Jesus. I ask, Lord, that this would be the beginning of a beautiful journey for them and that you would help them to realize that although living for you is not easy, that it is certainly the best life we could possibly live because we're living it in confidence that no matter what we're going through, the best is still ahead of us. That we can have a relationship with the one who made us and that heaven is now a reality for us. I pray that you would bless the remainder of our worship time together. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, listen up. Stay standing. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to work.